Hello, hello! Today's the day we finally get to take a look at these beautiful Isaro watercolors. At least, I think they're going to be beautiful. I hope they're going to be beautiful. Let's find out! On jacksonsart.com, they have curated this set of 10 Isaro watercolors, and because it's a curated set, it's at a discount over if you buy them separately. So that is why I ended up with this set of 10. And last year I ordered some Da Vinci watercolors and it came with this extra 10, and I'm going to use that 10 for these watercolors. So I'm just pulling off the Da Vinci sticker, and I'll get the goo off of there later because it did leave a bit of a residue. I don't want a Da Vinci sticker for Isaro watercolors, just a personal preference. And then I went ahead and filled up full pans with these watercolors, and you'll see them swatched a bit later here in the video, and pulled out the innards of this tin and pulled the rivets right out of the metal holders, and that way I was able to fit all 10 full pans in here because there wasn't enough room in between the two metal pan holders for a full pan to fit. So it just wasn't possible without taking the metal pieces out of here. So I did that because it leaves a nice flat surface on the bottom for me to affix the full pans to. And it can be really hard to get these rivets off sometimes, but sometimes it's super easy, kind of scary easy. <laughs> so you can see just a little bit of force and pressure and they come off and then it allows you to put the pans in whatever arrangement and configuration that you would like to. And it's pretty soft tin without the metal in there, so you just have to reshape it. If you bend it at all, it's not too big of a deal, but this one was a little bit trickier. It's easier if you get pliers to do this, but I was too lazy to get up and go to the other room where the pliers are, so we just struggled a little bit. And then I kind of played with arranging the full pans on there my pans are still very wet, but I wanted to see how, I don't know, how they would fit, how I would like them to be, and I've had them in this little tin that they came in. This is probably the next day, and they're as wet as if they were still freshly poured. These do tend to stay wetter longer, and then even when I paint later, I think it had been a week that they had been in these pans and all of the paint under the first soft layer was pretty, well, still wet. <laughs> that didn't really make sense, the soft layer, but it was a soft layer on top, kind of barely a film at all on the top. So I imagine these are going to stay wet for a long time. So Isaro watercolors are handcrafted in Belgium, and they use acacia gum as the binder along with just a little bit of glycerin and honey. So it's no wonder that they're staying pretty soft. And something really cool about this set, even though I have trouble with some of the color selection later, which I'll tell you about, is they're all single pigment colors except for the Payne's Gray, and that's really nice. When I got the Holbein watercolors in that video, which I'll link for you above and in the description box below, when I was actually swatching them out, I was like, oh, I made a mistake. Big mistake. I should have just picked a few colors, even if I couldn't afford very many and made my own selection because the Holbein watercolors in that set are multi-pigment colors. So this is a nice treat that these are all single pigment except for the Payne's Gray. And in the swatching section here, the parts that I cut out of the video is me taking and watering the bottom part of each square. So I basically water at the black line and under just to give the paint something to hit. It's neat because we can see if the paint runs or spreads it all in water and it also helps the gradient that I want in this swatch to form. So I also skip putting salt on the right side of each swatch. I just think you know, that's too long for you guys to watch, but I will describe all the rest of it here for you and all the pigments. This one here is Isaro Yellow Light. It's a PY154 with a light fast rating of eight out of eight. And on the label, it says that it's fully transparent, but when it dries, it covers my black Sharpie line quite a bit. I would say this is more like semi-opaque or at the most favorable, semi-transparent. However, it's beautiful and I had no trouble with it at all, so that was not a problem. This one here is the Yellow Ochre. It's a PY42, 8 out of 8 life fastness, and they label this one as either semi-transparent or semi-opaque. It's a, basically a raindrop half filled in, however that goes.
This one here is Oxide Orange. It's a PR 101, so strange choice for an orange, but we'll talk more about that later. Light fast rating of 8 out of 8, and they consider this one transparent, but again, it very much covers my black line when it dries. This is Burnt Sienna. It's a PBR7, semi-transparent, and I would agree with that. Light fast rating of 8 out of 8 on this one. And it's a nice burnt sienna. It's even lighter than the oxide orange and nearly the same hue, even though they're different pigments. The oxide orange was the PR101 and this is a PBR7. They're very similar. And I'll show you again more on that a little bit later in the video. This one here is their Venetian Red. It's a PR 101 and they labeled this as purely opaque. <laughs> Truly opaque. The raindrops completely filled in. However, it dries with less on the black line than some of the other colors like the Oxide Orange and the Yellow Ochre, even the yellow. But it's a beautiful Venetian Red. I actually have very warm fuzzies towards this particular version of the PR 101. This here is their Scarlet Red, and it's the PR255 with the light fast rating 8 out of 8. And they're also calling this one fully transparent, but there's a lot of sediment that dries on my black line. So I am kind of curious about that because some of these others that also say they're transparent don't have any remaining sediment on the black line, but this one does along with the others I've already talked to you about. This one here is the Thalo Blue and it's the PB15 colon 3. Light fast rating 8 out of 8 and they call it fully transparent and I agree this one doesn't cover my line at all. Now I know that Kimberly Crick and several others have done videos on this. I just don't have time to go re-watch them so eventually I will just to refresh my memory on their thoughts on these paints but I just can't right now so I'm giving you my first impressions. And this is the Ultramarine Blue. This one is beautifully granulating. It's a PB29 as usual, light fast rating 8 out of 8. And they're calling this one semi-transparent. And I would agree with that. I have just a tiny bit of sediment drying on my black line. And I just had good feelings when I put this paint down. Like, this is pretty. This feels good. I like this one. Those kind of feelings. This next one is the Isero Rose. It's a PR122, absolutely beautiful, bright, rosy color. Love it. And if the light fast rating of 8 out of 8 is true, that'll make it even better. So we'll have to put these in the window as soon as we can and start the tests on them. It is fully transparent. And now we have the only multi-pigment one in the entire selection, the Payne's Gray. This is made up of PBK11, PB29, and PB15. Light fast rating 8 out of 8. And they're calling this one fully opaque, and I completely disagree. <laughs> I guess maybe it's hard to see how much the black is covering my black line, so maybe that's part of it. But even if I hold it at an angle, it does not seem like there's a bunch of sediment over my Sharpie line. So I think maybe this one would be semi-transparent if I had to judge it. And all dried with the salt rubbed off, so my disappointment in the set. I don't really mind that there's just a yellow ochre and a light yellow because I tend to not use my medium yellow most of the time anyway. I use the yellow ochre. Anyway, that's fine. But this, the oxide orange and the burnt sienna, and having the oxide orange be more pigmented than the burnt sienna kind of bums me out because... This was in the slot, you know, when they put them in there that would be in your orange slot, but ugh, it doesn't even gradient out to an orange that you would want to use in this set. So it just seems like we should have one or the other. You definitely don't need both. So it would have been nice to leave one of these out and have an additional color added into this set of 10. But the rest of the colors are really spot on for what I enjoy. I love this Venetian red. It's beautiful and it went on the paper so nicely. I also really like how the feel of the ultramarine blue went on the paper. It'll be fun to try these on actual work and see how they are because I kind of wondered if they were hard to re-wet, but I couldn't quite tell. 
So they're still a little wet in the pans, even though I think it's been a week. To start out with, just found this book in that big pile of stuff that I showed you on my channel from my grandma's house. And I thought it would be fun to just do one of these little paintings in here. And then I will paint my own painting with these paints as well, because this paper is very much just cellulose, not awesome paper, but I still am dying to try this book. So we're going to do that and a little painting later. Just like I said, you'll be able to see it both ways. So all the little projects in here are perforated. So I'm going to pull one out if I can. We'll see how that goes and tape it to a board since the paper's not awesome. Ooh, it came out super easily. Anyway, since the paper's not awesome, I thought it would be fun to tape it down. And I think that would help it out. I have my acrylic sheet out and it occurred to me, I'm actually going to wet the back of this paper too. I think that's gonna help it um, even more. I do this sometimes. I actually did it when I painted those swatches just to give it a little extra anti-warp power. <laughs> So I'll just kind of glue it with water and then tape it. And I decided since the back side of the paper was nice and wet, I would go ahead and wet the front of it and it'd be like a homemade do-it-yourself stretching fireman style. That, that doesn't make sense. A uh, layman style maybe? <laughs> uh, DIY do-it-yourself at home style? But while it was wet, I stuck some paint on it. Just, I don't know, couldn't help myself. And these flowers had some cute little dots in them and things that I wanted to save. So I did put some masking fluid on it and then I just started painting in. And yeah, you can tell the paint kind of stays on the surface more than obviously it would with arches or any kind of 100% cotton paper, but it was still really fun. Just the spots in this particular book are big enough, at least on this particular coloring page, that you can use watercolor on it without getting really frustrated. And here I grabbed the thalo blue just neat and just dropped it right into the base of the flower and it created a fun little effect there later. So I repeated that along through the whole flower, skipping every other one so they wouldn't bleed into each other when I didn't want them to, and just had a fun relaxing time. I was listening to some YouTube videos, some that talk a lot where you don't have to see what they're doing, and then I turned an audio book on a couple of times here and there when I ran out of YouTube videos that I couldn't just listen to. Some art videos you have to watch, you know, you can't just listen to them. <laughs> and here I'm mixing up some of the greens and that was really fun because I got this kind of minty green and it was really pretty. And from here it was just filling in the little puzzle pieces. So I have some students that say they don't like puzzles, but they're enjoying painting. And I find that really interesting because to me, doing a painting is kind of like a puzzle. And I guess when you're doing your own painting where you're just kind of experimenting with the paint and you don't have detailed drawing that you're trying to follow, maybe it is more free. But when you're even filling in your own drawing on watercolor paper or doing a book like this, it is more of filling in a puzzle piece. So I am curious how that dichotomy works between people who don't like puzzles but who like to paint and I'm curious what their style will develop to be. Probably more loose and flowing, I would guess. For this particular coloring page, I wanted to limit the palette so it wouldn't get too crazy. So I'm sticking with that rose color, the Isabel Rose and the Thalo Blue. And the greens, you just gotta mix up greens because this set doesn't have any greens in it, sadly. That's something I'm sorely going to miss along with a purple. And yes, I made my own greens and I can make my own purples, but for me, I enjoy having those convenience colors, so it's kind of a bummer that this set has the extra oxide orange or burnt sienna, one or the other, and not a green or a purple. So sad. But regardless, I'll get lots of mixing practice when I use this palette, and the colors are quite pretty, especially this rose. I didn't notice anything particularly striking about this paint doing this coloring page, nor did I notice anything annoying or frustrating with it either. So for me, I suspect this paint is going to sit kind of middle of the road. It isn't gonna be a favorite like Core or Rosa, but it's not going to be low on the list either. And when I use the ultramarine blue, you can't really see it in the very bottom of this picture here, but it is, there you go, now you can see it. It is highly, highly granulating. So that could make some really fun, moody, what do you think, uh, weathery type of rainy scenes in paintings in the future. So I'm going to keep that in mind. 
And here I was all proud of myself because I thought I'd finished the painting entirely, and I realized later I didn't take the masking fluid off. I was like, oh, oops, <laughs> gotta pull that off. But I liked those little dots being blue like that because my PBO masking fluid is blue. So <laughs> I finally realized that, pulled them off, and then painted them in the, oh, the weather, the weather scheme. Oh my goodness, that's so funny. I don't know where that came from, but the color scheme of the painting itself. And that was really fun to see that come together. And of course, the satisfying tape peel. And here it is, back in real time and up close and personal so that you can see some details. Nothing really bad or really, well, I liked it. I liked how it turned out. I think <laughs> on this paper is surprisingly smooth and very satisfying. Next up here, I wanted to try it on the queen bee of all papers, arches. <laughs> so this is a beautiful picture that a friend of mine took on Facebook and she gave me permission to paint it, which is so awesome. I will try and get a picture of that up here for you on the screen. And you can see that I did mask off a couple of branches just to make my life easier. And I wanted to use just the phthalo blue mixed in with some other colors, but I wanted to avoid the ultramarine because I didn't want to see any of the granulation in this particular sky. So I calmed the phthalo blue down by adding some of the scarlet red into it. And then later here, I am adding the scarlet red and some of the Payne's gray just to get some of the darker blue going on. That was really fun. I enjoyed that a lot. So during this process, I had no frustration with the paint again. It seemed like normal paint, <laughs> nothing special, nothing not special. But I did have some frustrations with these brushes and I've mentioned them to you guys maybe once or twice. More to my Patreons over there. They know that I'm having some trouble with them. The really big mop brush that you see me using right now tends to have a couple of hairs that poke out the side a little bit strangely when you're dragging it across the surface. Even when it's fully wet, it just has these two hairs, at least two or three hairs. And then you go to find them and you can't, and I don't wanna cut them off or anything. It's not like they stick out all the time, it's just sometimes. And then the smaller round brush, the size, let me look here, eight, has a hook at the end and it, that developed almost immediately. So along with the loose ferrules that came with the set, I'm having some difficulties with them now in addition to that. So that's frustrating. I was tempted to send them back and I'm like, these stink. I'm gonna get out my regular brushes that I used to use all the time, my Windsor Newton Cotman. So I dug those out of the drawer and started using those. I haven't done that yet in this video, so you'll see that coming up here in a bit. But uh, then I use those and I'm like, oh, well, never mind. These brushes aren't any good either. So I think today I was just a brush snob and that's all there is to it. So I actually put the Cotman brushes back away and decided that yes, Lindsay's brushes were better than my Cotman brushes but the hook on the end of that one is driving me crazy and I still need to fix the loose barrels because I have been lazy. No, I have been busy is what I have been and I have not fixed those loose barrels yet. So here I'm pulling the masking fluid off using the masking fluid eraser that was gifted to me. I use that thing all the time. It is awesome. And it was just the masking fluid. I'm like, why do I still have this on there? It's totally in my way and I need to put dark spots in there. So finally realized, took that out and use that. So yeah, there you can see I took my Windsor & Newton brushes out and then that one, the black handled one, that is a Princeton, well, let me see what it is, Princeton Aqua Elite. Now that is a nice brush. That was also a gift by a YouTube friend here and I love this brush. So that one is a winner. I like that better than any of these, but the Cotman ones were not better than Lindsay's brushes and that actually made me feel better about the whole day. <laughs> Because I'm like, oh, the brushes I thought were goddesses of brushes <laughs> are not better than hers, at least. So I felt better about my purchase of her brushes. So at first I thought I'm not getting a dark enough gray with the Payne's gray. But that was my fault. I was getting reused. Like I, like I said, I was having a bad brush day. <laughs> I was having too much moisture in the brush, not enough pigment. But when I switched to that smaller Princeton brush, then I was able to get the darks as dark as I needed to. I think that big mop brush just was holding too much water in the little one. I didn't want to use the little one because 
it wasn't going to be big enough, but then I ended up using that little Princeton Aqua Elite and that was perfect. So you can see I got plenty dark enough and you can see I'm using that Princeton Aqua Elite again to get even more darks in there. And that is just a nice brush. I love that brush. So I will try and find a link for that one and link it down below. I like it better than any of these. So if you can find the Princeton Aqua Elites, maybe in bigger sizes, go with that instead of these others. I don't know. I do like the large flat brush in Lindsay's set for sure, and I haven't used the others to their full potential yet either. But even that large flat one, just it sucks in the water, so it's, it's interesting. I mean, that's probably what it's supposed to do, but I don't know. As far as the paint goes, beautiful colors. You can see that I am going to miss having a green and a purple. Sad. But guess what? These are tubes, and I have a lot of paint left in these tubes. So I could create my own convenience mixture pull out one of those browns, the either the burnt sienna or the oxide orange, to give me space for two more pans, because I have a space for one pan right now in the palette, but if I pulled one of those out, I had to have space for two. Wow, that did not come out right, but you guys know what I mean. I would have space for two is what I was trying to say. And I could mix up my own convenience green and convenience purple. Why do we call them convenience? I guess because they're conveniently mixed for you already? Yeah, that makes sense. Well, this has been a bit of a rambly video here, but I hope that you've enjoyed not seeing this sped up by too much. I tried to keep it only at 500%. Sometimes I speed these up to like 5,000%. That just gets kind of crazy, but when the videos get really long, I tend to take mercy on you guys and speed things up. But this one I'm just keeping at 500%. Even though it's kind of just splotching in details here and there, nothing too special about it. I didn't get into a super detailed tree. I had no desire to do that. I wanted to try and keep the brush strokes showing, things loose and free. And when I look back at this, I'm like, oh, I could have brightened the sky up. I think I dulled the sky down a little more than I needed to. But this is a picture that I am keeping in my references. I definitely will paint this one again. There's another tree I painted previously on Arches paper with a face in it that I may try and paint again too because I think I could do a better job now. So I am going to speed up the rest of this a little bit more and just get you to the end where I can talk to you again about my conclusions. That's it, that's all. Here we are up close. And when I finally got a brush out that didn't drive me crazy, we did pretty good. It's going to be hard as usual for me to say a whole lot about the paint. <laughs> Except for what I've already told you because you can't, I can't know much with just a couple of plays here. So we will have to continue on our explorations in the future. I am grateful to have them. Wish the color choices were different like I've already mentioned. Love working on good paper, although this was fun. I didn't mind it at all. Well, that is Isero in a nutshell. <laughs> Have you guys used Isero watercolors? If so, what do you think of them? Definitely let me know in the comments below. I'm very curious about that. One thing I am grateful for is that they're all single pigment colors except for the Payne's Gray, so that is a bonus. But I wish that I had chosen my own colors. I know, I've already mentioned that. All right, guys, I hope you have a fantastic weekend and I hope you paint something beautiful. Bye for now. I said don't make noise. What? I said don't talk and don't make noise and then you make noise. I'm noise? filming. <laughs> Go check the propane. <laughs> okay. Hey, I was just talking again. <laughs> Look how the sun is shining over the snow back here. So pretty. Oh, pretty.